before breakfast and uh, 12 units before uh, dinner before so morning dose which we have calculated 24 24 units again divided into by two third and one third ratio which means in the morning we advise the patient uh, 12 units uh, 16 units of n and 8 and 8 units of r and uh, before dinner dose which we have calculated uh, 12 units that is divided 50 50 which means 6 units n and 6 uh, units r no i repeat so we have decided to put the patient on insulin and the calculated dose is 36 units that is the starting dose so 24 units that is 2/3 in the morning before breakfast and 1/3 uh, that is 12 units before dinner morning dose is again divided into 2/3 n and 1/3 r which means uh, 16 units n and 8 units of r are given in the morning and uh, pre dinner dose which is 12, which is uh, 12 units divided into 6/6 that is 50 50 Uh, six units R and six units of the N. Now, how to monitor the? We start the patient and with this unit that is thirty-six units, uh, and then we advise the patient to check the blood sugar level. See after three days uh, how to adjust. The fasting glucose is primarily determined by the prior evening long-acting insulin. Suppose. today fasting insulin is high then today night uh, insulin that is n insulin the dose is increased by 2 or 4 units depending on the sugar level the pre lunch glucose is a function of the morning short acting insulin suppose uh, today pre uh, or hour after uh, breakfast that is pre lunch in sugar is high then the next morning uh, we increase the dose of r in the morning the pre supper glucose is a function of the morning long acting insulin we check the insulin before dinner if it is high the next morning uh, and the dose of the n is increased the bedtime glucose is a function of the uh, pre dinner short acting so that is uh, r and it is adjusted accordingly which so the food. Uh, this is the regime used uh, by mixing of uh, short acting that is regular insulin and uh, intermediate acting that is nph another regime is uh, we give the single dose of long acting insulin at bed time this no relation with the meals and ultra short acting insulin are given before each meal depending on the number of meal patient having that may be two that may be three or five we give the glargain 10 years starting dose at bed time no relation with the food and lisprobe which is an ultra short tracking insulin the starting dose is 6 units before each meal and then we adjust accordingly the fasting sugar is a function of glargain that is long acting insulin we check the fasting sugar if it is high then that night uh, we increase the dose of uh, glargain by 2 units uh, we keep on checking the till the fasting sugar becomes normal that is near 120 mg per deciliter and the postprandial uh, insulin that is after breakfast or after lunch or after dinner that is function of the lispro then we check the postprandial prandial glucose level and the next day we increase the dose of the lispro with that particular injection For example, today take the postprandial uh, sugar that is after lunch uh, that is high, say 240. Then the next day we increase the uh, lispro dose by two units. That is, we make it eight units, and we keep on checking till the time it becomes normal. That is near 140 or 150 range. So this uh, the two regimes. Uh, one is mixing of. Uh, regular and nph and this is advantage this the regime has advantage of twice a daily injection the second is second regime for insulin is one injection of ultra long acting insulin at bed time and multiple injections before each meal 
Uh, this shows the sites of insulin uh, injection and the show the hypertrophy induced by the insulin. And in the view, the type 2 diabetes matters, the management. Uh, the goals of uh, therapy for type 2 diabetes are almost similar to those of type 1. By glycemic control tends to dominate the management of type 1. The care of individuals with type 2 must also include attention to the treatment of conditions associated with type 2, like uh, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular diseases, and other related complications. Uh, uh, many patients uh, with type 2 diabetes have a pretty long preclinical period. So at the time of diagnosis of type 2, many patients have the evidence of uh, complication. And majority of the patients are suffering from other diseases also. So this is the basic difference between type 1 and type 2. Now we put the patient on oral hypoglycemic agents, the first group of bigonides. If the patient is uh, above 40, type 2 diabetic, and uh, patient is obese, the first group of medicine we use is bigonides. And most uh, commonly used medicine in this group is metformin with the name of uh, glucophage. Now metformin reduces hepatic glucose production through an undefined mechanism and improves peripheral utilization of the glucose. Metformin reduces fasting plus glucose and insulin levels, improves the lipid profile and promotes modest weight loss. Then sulfonyl ureas, known as insulin secretogogues, uh, they are different types, uh, the first generation, second generation, and third generation. First generation is chlorpropamide, tolazamide, and tolbutamide. A maximum, uh, maximum dose of first generation, a similar potency to second generation, but have a longer half-life a greater incidence of hypoglycemia and more frequent drug interaction. So first generation sulfonyl ureas are having half long, long the half life. And if patient develops hypoglycemia, it's difficult to treat her. The second generation sulfonyl ureas, glimipride is a very popular medicine nowadays. It comes with the name of Getril or Emarin. Its dose is uh, one to eight uh, milligram, effect lasts for 24 hours. Start. These medicines are usually given in type 2 patients for normal weight or less than the normal weight. And the starting dose of glimipride is 1 milligram, gradually increased to 2, then 3, 4. If when, it is required, when the dose requirement is more than 4, then it is given in 2 doses. For example, if patient requires 6 milligram, so 3 milligram BD is given. Up to 4 milligram, we can give between a single dose. The second is glipizide, uh, graporide, uh, a different type of medicine, then uh, non sulfur ureas, uh, repoglutinide, and neticlutinide. So, because of uh, shorter half life, uh, these are preferred to the first generation. An advantage uh, to a more rapid onset of action is better coverage of the post prandial glucose rise. But the shorter half life of such agent requires more than once a day. So, once a Half-life is shorter. You have to give uh, these medicines uh, uh, two or three times a day. The sulfonyl urea has reduced both fasting and postprandial glucose and should be initiated at low doses and increased to one to two weeks interval based on the sugar levels. Next, uh, metaglinides. Uh, uh, these are repaglutinide and uh, Repaglutinide and neticlutinide. They are not sulfonyl ureas but also interact with the ATP sensitive potassium channels. Because of their short half life, these agents are given with each meal or immediately before or reduce meal related glucose excursions. Insulin skeletogogues are generally well tolerated. All of these agents, uh, however, have the potential to cause profound and persistent hypoglycemia, especially in elderly individuals. Hypoglycemia is usually related 
to delayed meals, increased physical activity, alcohol intake, or renal insufficiency. The next group in uh, oral hypoglycemia agents are alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Glucosidase inhibitors, the ACRABOS, uh, reduce postprandial hyperglycemia by delaying glucose absorption. They do not affect glucose utilization or insulin secretion. Now, these drugs act within the GIT and they reduce the absorption of the glucose. The drug is not absorbed, so they do not affect the peripheral utilization or insulin secretions. The major side effects of uh, these drugs are uh, so diarrhea, flatulence, uh, abdominal distension, the ability to increase delivery of uh, oligosaccharide to the large bowel and can be reduced somewhat by gradual upward dose titration. Therapy should be initiated at a low dose, that is 25 milligram pecrobose with the evening meal and may be increased to a maximum dose uh, for weeks to months to up to 100 milligram. The next will be thiazolidinidiones, uh, pyoglitazone, the main uh, major drug in this group, other is uh, rosiglitazone. Pyoglitazone is given 15 to 45 milligram per day in a single daily dose. We start the patient uh, uh, with single dose, that is 15 milligram, observe the patient, check the blood sugar level, and gradual dose is increased to 30 milligram per day and 45. Whether 15, 30 or 45 is given in a single dose. Uh, this agent can be combined with the uh, sulfonized urea or with the uh, bicarbonates. Now, rosiglitazone, the total daily dose is 2 to 8 milligram per day administered either once day or maximum twice daily. The ability of thiazolid dinidiones to influence cardiovascular disease, other features of the metabolic syndrome is under investigation. There are certain serious cardiovascular side effects. Then feline alanine derivatives, neticlitinides, 60 and 120 milligrams available, given in three times a day, uh, 1.5 hours before the meals. Then presently a new group is introduced in the market and that is GLP-1 receptor agonist. That is glucagon-like receptor, glucagon-like peptide. GLP-1 receptor agonist, glucagon-like receptor one um, agonist. So drugs available in this category is anixotide, bita with the name of bita, 1.2 and 2.54 ml pre-filled pre pens are available that contain 5 microgram or 10 microgram. They are given subcutaneously twice a daily, one hour, uh, twice a daily within one hour of breakfast and dinner. So I should decide to put the patient on biota, which weighs 1.2 ml range, which contains uh, 5 microgram and is given twice. If the patient's response is not good, then this can be increased uh, to 2.4 ml range that contains 10 microgram, uh, given one hour of the breakfast, uh, within one hour of breakfast and dinner, twice a daily. Uh, this drug should not be uh, used if the calculated creatinine clearance is less than 30 ml per minute. Another drug in this group is uh, liraglutide with the name of Victoza, pre filled multi dose pen that delivers doses of 0.6 mg, 1.2, or 1.8 subcutaneously. The starting dose is uh, 0.6 mg, gradually increased to 1.2 milligram and 1.8 milligram. For example, if the patient 0.6 milligram after increase to 1.2 milligram after a week, if no ad adverse reaction occurs, dose can be further increased to 1.8 milligram if necessary. Next group is uh, DPP4 inhibitors uh, drugs in this category are cetagliptin. 25, 50, and 100 milligram once a daily. Starting dose is uh, 25 milligram, gradually increased to 50 
earn up to 100 mg as a single dose. Second drug in this be, is a sexagliprin. It is available in the strength of 2.5 and 5 mg. 2.5 mg or 5 mg is a single dose. Starting dose is 2.5 mg and that again depends on the renal clearance. We have to see the renal clearance of the clearance of the creatinine. The beta cliptin with the name of Galbus uh, is 50 mg once or twice a day. So starting dose is 50 mg and depending upon the response of the patient they are increased to 50 mg BD. Then another group is uh, sodium glucose uh, transport to inhibitors. Sodium glucose transport to inhibitors. Uh, these are recently marketed in Pakistan. The three drugs are available in this group. Canagliflozin, 100 milligram to 300 milligram is the dose. Depagliflozin, 5 to 10 milligram. And empagliflozin, 10 to 25 milligram. The starting dose is 5 milligram for depagliflozin. And then it can be, we can go up to 10 milligram. All three drugs are given in a single dose. Uh, Canagliflozin, the starting dose is uh, 100 milligram. And we go up to the 300 milligram. Depagliflozin, 5 milligram, can go up to 10 milligram. And empagliflozin, uh, 10 to 25 milligram. The starting dose is 10. If uh, the response is not good, we can go increase up to 25. So, uh, certain other groups uh, are always uh, are also considered this uh, type 2 diabetes, but they are not um, uh, commonly used. Uh, uh, but they are uh, hyperglycemic agents. Uh, these are bromocriptine that can be given 0.8 milligram per day, increase after one week, and we can go up to 4.8 milligram. Then, prominide 5 ml, while 6 milligram per ml. Uh, this is like again given in, uh, this is used in type 2 insulin, type 2 uh, diabetes, that is non-insulin dependent diabetes. So these are these medicines are not available in Pakistan, so we are not using these medicines, just a theoretical point of view. I think. Then the pancreatic transplantation has been tried uh, experimentally, but um, no successes so far. Eyelid transplant, another option. Now, uh, just repetition uh, in type 2 diabetes uh, if the patient is uh, above the age of 40 and obese, we start with the bicornis, that is uh, metformin. Starting dose is, uh, say, for 500 milligram twice a day. We can go up to 1 gram thrice a day. So, this dose range is 500 milligram to 3 grams. If patient is uh, not overweight and above 14 in type 2 diabetes, we start with the sulfonylureas, and certain other agents can also be used nowadays. And these uh, drugs which are uh, available, bigonides, uh, other groups, uh, uh, they can be combined. And the more than one medicine can be given depending upon the response of the patient and blood sugar level of the patient. Next we come to the important aspect of uh, diabetes blitters, the complications of the diabetes. Now there are two types of uh, complications of diabetes, acute and chronic. The acute complications uh, are diabetic ketoacidosis and hyper or smaller non-ketotic diabetic coma. And diabetic ketoacidosis is a very important condition because uh, if you treat the patient in time, you can save their life. If the patient is not treated in time, the mortality rate is very high. Now, diabetic ketoacidosis was formally considered a hallmark of type 1 diabetes mellitus, but it also occurs in individuals who lack immunological features of type 1 diabetes 
and uh, who can subsequently be treated with oral glucose lowering agents. What are the clinical features of uh, diabetes uh, ketoacidosis? Now, ketoacidosis uh, may be the initial symptom complex that leads to diagnosis of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Sometimes the first presentation of diabetes mellitus in a young person is ketoacidosis, type 1 diabetes. But more frequently, it occurs in individuals with established diabetes. The patient is a known patient of diabetes because of certain reason can go into ketoacidosis. The nausea or vomiting are often prominent and their presence in an individual with diabetes warrants laboratory evaluation for the ketoacidosis. Any patient who is a known patient of diabetes he develops nausea and vomiting uh, top on the list that uh, you should consider the possibility of uh, ketoacidosis. These patients uh, also develop abdominal pain that may be severe and can resemble sometimes with uh, uh, acute pancreatitis or ruptured fixtures. So nausea, vomiting, pain of abdomen, they are the usual uh, presenting symptoms in ketoacidosis. Hyperglycemia leads to glucosuria, that leads to polyuria, volume depletion, tachycardia. Hypertension can occur because of uh, volume depletion in combination with peripheral vasodilatation. So there are two factors uh, are working in diabetic ketoacidosis that lead to the development of uh, hypertension. One is volume depletion, the second is because of a toxic condition, a shock-like condition, a patient develops toxic uh, vasodilatation. The both factors lead to hypertension. The patient develops acidosis uh, that can lead to customal respiration or acidotic respiration and a fruity odor on the patient's breath. Uh, that is because of the acetone, acetone, uh, acetoacetic acid or ketone bodies. Secondary to metabolic acidosis and increased acetone. So acetone leads to the fruity smell in the uh, patient's breath. It's a classical sign of this disorder. We know that there are three types of ketone bodies, acetone, acetoacetic acid, and butyrhydrobutyric acid. See, acetone, the presence of acetone in the breath is responsible for the of protein uh, smell in the, body, in the patient's breath. Lethargy and central nervous system depression may evolve into coma with severe ketoacidosis, but should also prompt evaluation for other reasons for altered mental state. So many patients uh, with uh, ketoacidosis, when they report to uh, medical emergency, they are not in a normal neurology condition, their sensory system is impaired, they are semi-conscious or unconscious. Uh, obviously this is because of the ketoacidosis, but in diabetic patient who is uh, comatose or semi-comatose brought to emergency, one should also consider some other factors, and other reasons of patient going into comatose condition like uh, infection of our system, meningitis, encephalitis, hypoxia, sometimes they can develop the, the CVA or renal impairment. So any patient uh, who is suffering from ketoacidosis comes to emergency or brought to the emergency department. Of course, uh, uh, impaired consciousness or altered state of consciousness is because of ketoacidosis. But one should keep in mind certain other reasons that can coexist or independently causing the impairment of consciousness in any diabetic patient like infection, hypoxia. Cerebral edema and extremely serious complication decay is seen most frequent children. Signs of infection which may precipitate decay should be sought. Usually the ketoacidosis is precipitated by infection and uh, that, uh, that can be chest infection or UTI. So one should look for the signs of infection that is a precipitating uh, factor in the development of ketoacidosis that should be sought 
on physical examination, even in the absence of fever. Uh, tissue ischemia, that, that uh, primarily of uh, heart and brain, can also be a precipitating factor in the development of ketoacidosis. Precipitating events that can lead to ketoacidosis uh, in uh, diabetic patients, uh, they are inadequate insulin administration. Patient has reduced the amount or quantity of administration, of insulin administration. That leads to the high sugar level and uh, development of uh, ketoacidosis, infection, pneumonia, UTI, gastroenteritis, sepsis, that can precipitate ketoacidosis. Infarction, a patient of diabetes mellitus prone to develop cerebral infarction, coronary, myocardial infarction, mesenteric infarction, or peripheral artery involvement. So, development infarction is already known patient of uh, diabetes. is one of the factors which can lead to development of ketoacidosis. Drugs can also precipitate ketoacidosis. The patient is already on diabetic and insulin. Cocaine is the top of the list. Pregnancy can also one of the precipitating factors in type 1 diabetes that can lead to ketoacidosis. What's pathophysiology? Diabetic ketoacidosis results from relative or absolute insulin deficiency combined with counter-regulatory hormone excess that is glucagon, catecholamine, cortisol and growth hormone. So on the one hand there is a deficiency of insulin and on the other hand the hyperactivity or increased levels of glucagon, catecholamines, cortisol and growth hormone. Both insulin deficiency and uh, glucagon excess in particular are necessary for the decay to develop. The decreased ratio of insulin to glucagon promotes uh, gluconeogenesis. I repeat, the decreased ratio of insulin to glucagon promotes gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, and ketone body formation in the liver, as well as increases in substrate delivery for fat and muscle, that is free fatty acid, amino acid, to the liver. As bicarbonate stores are depleted, metabolic acidosis ensures. Increased lactic acid production also contributes to the acidosis. This is like uh, adding uh, insult to an injury. The increased free fatty acid, increased triglyceride and VLDL production, that is very low density lipoproteins. Very low density lipoprotein clearance is uh, also reduced because the activity of insulin sensitive lipoprotein lipase in muscle and fat is decreased. Then there's hypertriglyceridemia that may be severe. Uh, sometimes it can cause hypertriglyceridemia, sometimes it can cause acute pancreatitis. DKA is initiated by inadequate levels of plasma insulin precipitated by increase in requirement of insulin as might occur during, as I mentioned earlier, during infection. Failure to augment insulin therapy often compounds the problem. The patient is handling the insulin and the requirement of insulin is increased and the patient is not increasing insulin to meet the new requirement. And that is another factor in the development of ketoacidosis. Occasionally, occasionally, a uh, complete uh, omission insulin by the patient or healthcare team uh, in a hospital patient with type 1 diabetes that is precipitous decay. Patient using uh, insulin infusion devices with short acting insulin are at increased risk of decay. Since even a brief interruption in the insulin delivery that quickly leads to insulin deficiency. What are the lab abnormalities in these cases? DKA is characterized by uh, hyperglycemia, ketosis, metabolic acidosis, that is increased anion gap metabolic acidosis, along with number of secondary metabolic derangements. Occasionally, the serum glucose is only minimally elevated. Serum bicarbonate is frequently less than 10 millimoles per liter. Arterial pH ranges between 6.8 and 
depending upon the severity of the acidosis. Despite a total body potassium deficit, the serum potassium at presentation may be mildly elevated secondary to acidosis. Total body stores of sodium, chloride, phosphorus, magnesium are also reduced in TKA uh, but are not accurately reflected by their levels in the serum because of dehydration and hyperglycemia. When dehydration and hyperglycemia are corrected, then the exact figure is there. Elevated blood urea, nitrogen and serum creatinine levels reflect intravascular volume depletion. Interference from acetoacetate may falsely elevate the serum creatinine environment. Leukocytosis, upper triglyceridemia and hyperlipoproteinemia are commonly found as well. Hyperepilesemia may suggest a diagnosis of pancreatitis, that is increased level of serum amylase, especially when accompanied by abdominal pain. However, in DKA, the amylase is usually of salivary origin and thus is not diagnostic of pancreatitis. Serum lipase should be obtained if pancreatitis is suspected. So in such circumstances, uh, amylase is not specific. So in uh, ketoacidosis, when you suspect the pancreatitis and want to confirm serum lipase is a better investigation. The metabolic derangements of DKA exist along spectrum, beginning with mild acidosis with moderate hyperglycemia, evolving into more severe finding. The degree of acidosis and hyperglycemia do not necessarily correlate closely, since a variety of factors determine the level of hyperglycemia that is oral intake, urinary glucose loss. Ketone urea is consistent finding the ketoacidosis and distinguish it from simple hyperglycemia. The differential diagnosis of uh, ketoacidosis include the starvation ketoacidosis, alcoholic ketoacidosis, and increased anion gap acidosis. How to manage uh, such patients? This. I think this is the, uh, I would say, the most important medical emergency management. The first confirmed diagnosis by plasma glucose, positive serum ketones, and metabolic acidosis. Aim admit to hospital, intensive care unit, if the pH is less than 7 or unconscious patients. Check the serum electrolytes, that is potassium, sodium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate. Now there are the basic principle of uh, management of ketoacidosis. You should must remember the basic principles and then the detail of this. Principles are fluid therapy, patient is severely dehydrated, we have to replace fluid. Second is insulin, third is antibiotic, and fourth the correction of potassium. So the four basic principles, fluid therapy to treat dehydration, insulin, antibiotic for the infection, and correction of the low uh, hypokalemia. So first is dehydration. The usual fluid loss in such patient is 6 to 8 liters. We give 500 ml to 1 liter of 0.9% saline in first hour. So 500 ml to 1 liter of 0.9% saline is given for the first hour. In the first hour when the patient goes to emergency or is in ICU. Then we give 300 ml to 500 ml per hour for the next 4 to 12 hours. They continue the infusion of 0.45% saline at the rate of 200 to 300 ml per hour. When glucose level is 300 mg per hour, then change it to the dextrose water. Initially, we give the 0.9%. If we find the serum sodium is high, then we, replace, uh, we, we prefer 0.45. 0.45% saline if the serum sodium is above 160. If it is not above 160 or uh, the range of 145 or 50, then we give the 0.9%. The rate is 500 to 1 liter, first hour, 300 ml to 500 ml, 
next four to twelve hours, and two hundred or three hundred for the next uh, twelve hours, that is twenty-four hours. The usual fluid loss is six to eight liters, so minimum six liters of fluid uh, given in the six liters given in, in first twenty-four hours. When glucose level is three hundred milligram per hour, they will change it to dextrose water instead of glucose line, sodium line, or normal line. Now, second thing is insulin. Here, why we short acting insulin, 0.5 to 0.2 unit per kg. Then insulin is given at the rate of 0.1 unit per kg. And roughly, uh, 25 unit of insulin added 250 ml of 0.9 percent line at the rate of 70 ml per hour. 25 unit, 250 ml. 70 ml per hour. This gives us 7 unit per hour. And gradually, this can be decreased to a 6, 4, and 3, depending on sugar level. The blood sugar level should fall for 80 mg per hour per deciliter per hour. If it does not fall, this then double the dose of insulin. Do not administer insulin until the potassium is corrected to 3.3. Now, sometimes uh, uh, Patient is, uh, having, patient is having hyperkalemia at the presentation. So in such patient, if the patient level is uh, less than 3.3, we do not give the insulin. We first correct the potassium and then start giving insulin. When glucose level becomes 250 ml per hour, then give insulin at the rate of 1 to 2 units per hour. So starting dose of insulin is roughly uh, 6 units per hour. And we keep on checking uh, sugar half hourly or hourly. When sugar level comes at about, say, 250, then decrease the dose of insulin to 2 units per hour. So there's a uh, potassium depletion in all these patients. Uh, how to correct it? Estimated deficit is 3 to 5 minimum per kg. Now, during treatment with insulin and fluids, the very factor contribute to the development of hypoglycemia. This includes uh, insulin mediated potassium transport into the cell. Insulin causes the movement of the potassium from the extracellular fluid into the cell. And there is resolution of acidosis, that is, betterment of the acidosis. And continuous urine loss of potassium. All these three factors combine together to lead to the hyperkalemia. We check the potassium level. No potassium is given, a serum potassium is above 5.3. 10 milliequivalent to 1 liter is added, if potassium is uh, from 5 to 5.3. 20 milliequivalent to 1 liter added, if the levels are between uh, 4.5 to 5. 30 milliequivalent of potassium chloride uh, added to, if the levels are uh, added to 1 liter of the fluid, if the level between 4 to 4.5. And 40 milligrams potassium added if the level is between 3.5 to 4. So, uh, the quantity of uh, potassium which you give uh, that depends upon the serum potassium level. Bicarbonates, uh, despite uh, sweet acid, bicarbonates treatment is usually not necessary. Despite uh, low blood uh, bicarbonate level, bicarbonate. Bicarbonate treatment is not necessary. In fact, theoretically, arguments suggest that bicarbonate administration and rapid reversal of acidosis may impair cardiac function, reduce uh, tissue oxygenation, and promote hypokalemia. Now, if the patient's uh, pH is up to seven, usually no carbon, no bicarb is given. If the pH is below seven, that is up to six point eight. Then the we advise the bicarbonate. The 50 millimol of per liter, 50 milli equivalent of uh, bicarbonate to the one liter. Also. If pH is uh, 6.9 to 1, then 100 millimol of uh, uh, soda bicarb per liter. This is discussion. Uh, uh, 100 millimole per liter soda bicarb is added to the saline. 
repeat the dose of bicarbonate every 2 hours until the ph is above above 7 antibodies uh, assess the patient uh, what precipitated episode uncomplaint infection un trauma infarction cocaine so one of the precipitating factor of the development of ketoacidosis infection so we give the um, third generation sphalosporins when the patient's uh, condition is better then we switch over the, uh, the patient to the intermediate or long acting insulin as uh, Now, IV insulin, regular insulin should be continued until the acidosis dissolves and the patient is metabolically stable. As the acidosis and insulin resistance associated with DK resolve, the insulin infusion rate can be decreased. Now the fourth uh, principal treatment in ketoacidosis is uh, fluid replacement, potassium, antibody insulin. Now ketoacidosis is a complication of diabetic mellitus, particularly type 1. And there are certain complications which are associated with ketoacidosis. A ketoacidosis is a complication of diabetes. And a certain complication associated with ketoacidosis. What are those complications? Uh, these are the cerebral edema, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, shock, hypoglycemia, myocardial infarction, or ischemic limb due to arterial thrombosis, then acute pancreatitis, and lactic acidosis, venous thrombosis, upper GAT bleed, ARDS. So, it was a quite lengthy lecture. Uh, next lecture is on Monday. I start with the second acute complications and then the chronic complications of uh, diabetes matters. And there's only one lecture for all these complications. I'll try to finish in one lecture on Monday. Any questions?